Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. So today we are going to be hearing from Judy Maycomer, who has been a master gardener since 2001. She has spent this time conducting pet themed gardening classes in Southern California and serving as editor at Pet Lovers Publications. She is also a housekeeper, cook, entertainment committee, and vegetable grower for her own amazing dogs. Through years of personal experience, Judy has become thoroughly educated on pet-friendly plants, which she is dedicated to sharing with other pet-loving gardeners. With her help, Judy promises that we can keep a beautiful garden while also making sure our furry friends stay happy and safe. Please join me in welcoming Judy. Early said, um... I'm not sure I can make your garden fantastic, but I can I can certainly help to uh, alleviate maybe some of the problems you face in in having a pet friendly garden, and in general, you know, dealing with the uh, layout of the yard better. And um, bear with me. This is I've done this presentation many times, but as far as Zoom uh, presentations. This is my first rodeo, as they say. <laughs> so <laughs> I will do the very best I can. And uh, please, uh, I, you know, I'm sure Shirley and Mel will help me with questions that you may have or anything else. You know, don't hesitate to stop me if you need, uh, uh, you know, an answer or have a question or just have an input. And I guess we'll kind of start in two directions today. Uh, you have handouts called Plant Planting with Your Pooch and Other Critters Too, which I enumerated uh, some chapters on. And But I'm going to also have Mel uh, do our, um, our first switch in the video too, in the presentation, so that you can kind of see what we're about here. That first picture there in the presentation is my little Yorkie Poo, um, Annie, which uh, has provided me with a lot of experience on little animals, dogs at, that munch items. I, I've been having pets for as long as I can remember, and each one has their own particular ways. And she definitely has her own particular ways. I've never had a pet that from the very beginning, this little rescue came in and started munching on various things in the yard and dragging them inside and even munching more. But um, she is providing me with a lot of experience on what not to include in your garden or what to take out. And we will talk more about that. Okay, let's go to the next one here. If any of you are new to being a pet owner, uh, I recommend certain things that you need to observe with your dog. And this is just a beginner's list, but it really seems to help when you bring your dog out into the backyard to do a serious observation on what they do and how they react to things. And as you see, uh, it says checking out the new dog and the old one. There's a list here of where they find out where they like to sleep, uh, if you have adequate shade, uh, you know, and we'll talk about how you can maybe provide some adequate shade in just a second. If, where he's going to make paths in the yard, and are these the paths that you've already set in, or are you going to have to uh, make some difference, differences in the paths you're going to do? And uh, of course, what happens when you come home, uh, you know, or with, when a neighbor goes by, do they hurl themselves against the fence? And is there, is there plants near the fence that might be dangerous, like thorny bushes or cactus or anything like that that you might need to move? And um, if, if that also uh, relates to if he sees another pet outside the yard, because you know, walking by with people walking their dogs near your backyard, they get very anxious and they want to check out the dog and they want to run up there. So that's something that you must look at. And um, does he run to one particular portion area of the fence? Well, of course, if it's going by, you know, if there's a walkway by your yard, he's going to be running to that. 
but there might be some other areas that he seeks out, maybe the neighbor's yard, maybe some spaces in the neighbor's yard that might not be quite so safe for him. So that's another thing to notate. And then of course, after a few days, uh, if it's a new pet and a, one that's just come home from the shelter or rescue, all of my dogs are rescue dogs. So I know that there's a lot of different things to put up with. You know, when, uh, in fact, I'm fostering a, a friend of mine's pet right now that came from the shelter, uh, well, came into the shelter so matted uh, two weeks ago that they had to actually uh, sedate the poor little thing to get it to get the hair off of it and get it more comfortable. And so it's been a little traumatic for this puppy. And so we're, you know, trying to deal with him and getting to know my dogs as well. And then, of course, tearing up the yard. Is it the whole yard? Is it just certain areas? And does he start digging? And if so, where is he digging? And we're going to have some tips on that in just a minute because uh, that is a problem. Okay, I'm going to scoop down here. And to the next one, uh, I've got the one with the, uh, the little Jack Russell with the book behind him. And that is, yeah, that was my first Jack Russell. <laughs> <laughs> and I, he, he had a lot of issues. So I immediately got a book. And as you see, he tried to really digest it himself. Because if you look in the upper left corner, you will see his chew marks. And um, so, you you know, I, I strongly advise, you know, working on training and working on, um, oh, turn up the volume. Okay, let me see how I can do that. Sorry, folks, like I said, I'm kind of new at this. Is that better? I hope, you know, just text me back if it's not, Peggy. And um, so anyway, uh, this little dog, you know, went into training and became a very good little Jack Russell, as did the next dog, next Jack Russell that you will see. Yes, and, uh, you know, Jack, although Jack did have a problem and he had to go to a trainer too, this was something unexpected. I knew he really liked balls because the, his previous owner told me that when we adopted him, she had to give him up because she had such severe allergies. And if you're familiar with Jack Russell's, they often shed like a snowstorm, and this one does in fact. But anyway, we brought Jack home and I said, oh, well, I told her when we met, I said, no problem. Uh, this, we don't have any balls in our backyard. You know, our Yorkie Coo doesn't really play with that and all that stuff. Well, unbeknownst to me, I guess there were balls in the backyard because he came in a few hours later with four of the most filthy balls you've ever seen and drug them all over the yard, you know, the inside the house. But anyway, uh, you know, I'd let him have one on occasion and it worked okay for a while, but then I started noticing in the backyard with him, if, if we wouldn't play with him, he would get the ball and throw it and do, you know, himself and then we'd get it. And that was fine, except for the palm that we have in the backyard. And he wound up throwing the ball into the pond and then jumping in afterwards. And as he did that, he'd swim around with the ball in his mouth, and our koi would follow him, sort of like an entourage. So that was definitely a time to take him to the vet and, and uh, I mean, to take him to the trainer and, and get some more done on him. Okay, moving on to the next one, I think, oh, this is an idea about sun and shade. Uh, being a publisher of pet resource guides for a while, I got a lot of pallets delivered to me with publications on them. So I was trying to find more shaded areas until my trees got larger. And I used these pallets. Some of them I put down for them to just sit on and lie on in the sun because you'll see that your dogs often like to sunbathe. 
and it's very good for them. The other option to that is if you get a, um, if you don't have enough shade, you can actually get an old um, table, you know, an outdoor wooden table and set it up like a picnic table. And the dogs will jump up on that and sun. And then if they need shade, they'll just go right under it. So you can provide a, you know, a little shady spot someplace where ordinarily you might not be able to have one for your dog. Okay, let's see, going on next picture is, let me see, I'll go down to, go with you guys. Oh, basic necessities. I think we talked about that, but maybe I skipped that, but I'll go ahead. Basic necessities, of course, are good shelter, food safe from insects, shady spots to lie on, and entertainment, like I said, with the toys and the sand pile. A sand pile will really work well for digging. Uh, I worked on this a lot because, you know, as you see from that picture, I had a dachshund also and a Jack Russell. And these are born diggers. They love to dig. And that was my slope before I had it landscaped more. And as you see in the right corner, there's a gopher, because I had gophers, and we'll talk about that. And, you know, it was like, thing, I think they caught one gopher in 10 years, but, you know, it's better than nothing, I guess. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, you know, a sand pile, a lot of times what you can do, if you catch them digging somewhere, make yourself a sand pile area and bring the bring whatever get a toy and stick it in the sand pile, get treats and stick it in the sand pile. And when you see them digging in some weird place, bring them over, show them the treat, stick it in the sand pile. And eventually this works pretty well. You know, they start looking for that. That's the first place they go to, to start looking for digging in things. And this can really be helpful for avoiding you know, your dog digging all over the yard. And of course, training will help with that too, but it takes time. Okay, and let's see, going down to the next one, I'm so sorry. Lying on Poochie, Jack. All right, happiness is digging in the yard, yes. <laughs> now we're gonna talk about digging in another way, the fencing area. The fencing area of your yard, for the most part, depending on the size of your dog, is not going to be super important. This fence that you see is one that uh, not only does it keep different animals from jumping in, and if you go to the top of that, you can see that there's a coyote roller up there, which is excellent for keeping not only coyotes out of your yard, but also cats, stray cats, feral cats in the neighborhood who often love to come into your yard and that new place that you just dug up and put your tomato plants in or whatever else it is that has that nice soft soil, that's a perfect place for them to take their poop. So, you know, if you want to alleviate some of that, you can do that with attaching things to the top of your fence. It just sort of depends on the size of, of your yard, the size of your fence, where you're located. But that's a few tips on, that might help you with that. Okay. Oh, the other thing about digging, going down, is breed of pet. Like I said, Jack Russells, Dachshunds, there's a lot of those that are born diggers. There's some of them that care less. My Yorkie Poo will dig just a little bit, but she gets bored very quickly on that. It's not for, it's not for her. And, uh, but if digging must, like I said, there's the instructions that I tried for digging things. And uh, one trick that I have to tell you about, um, I, uh, one day I was having a really hard time in, a, in my backyard in, this era, in an area that had some really hard dirt in it. Yeah, I was just doing, trying it with the shovel and I just couldn't get through. Well, you know, Jack was still in training about his digging issue and I weakened. I brought a treat over and I put it where I was digging 
and I let the dog dig there, and it was great because he dug, he really got into it and dug up and softened that whole area for me so I could plant better. But I don't recommend that as a, you know, usual path to getting your yard dug up. Um, let's see, what else have we done? Oh, we're going to talk about plants now. Um, I think, yes, um, plants. These are some of the plants that are drought tolerant, dog tolerant, and can withstand heat. And uh, butterfly bush, not only is that wonderful for attracting the butterflies that we have in this area here, sage is very good. African daisies, those what I call freeway daisies, but they're, they're very good for the area. Uh, moss rose, all of these are not toxic and they are very healthy and you know they're very good to they will survive with your pet depending on how big your pet is for some of them if if you have them in a yard area and you have this big lomax pet you might try to adapt them to large pots to grow in you know it's and and you know, just getting to know your dog in your yard, you might have to start with that and then move them in as the dog sort of relaxes and becomes less, you know, explorative on your yard. Okay, let's see what else are we going to do here. I'm sorry, I have to look out over here. Layout orchards. Oh, yes, this is some information about layout. And, and this one... This one lady, uh, her name is Cheryl Smith, did some interesting layout on her yard. She was laying out various things and she wanted to put the lavender in. And so she made sort of like a, a hedge on either side of a path with the lavender. And of course the lavender grew up there. Well, not only was it nice and lovely to look at and the dogs ran through it on their way back into the house. It helped make the dog smell better, but lavender is actually a flea repellent. So that made it, you know, a, a double whammy on, the, you know, having something nice in your yard that would really help your dog. In the long run, many dog owners find it best to pave the routes in your yard. I will show you some of the landscaping I did in just a minute and, and uh, we'll go further on that. I'm just trying to go through these little things first so that we can uh, move on to the presentation of that. Okay, yes, this is, this is uh, putting plants in among your, um, putting vegetable plants in among your landscaping. And I can see that she's got that up there. Let's see it as plainly as I can take it over to the scene on this one right now. But at any rate, yes, I took a class on, on landscaping um, with the garden in mind and putting plants in, you know, vegetation, vegetables that you want to grow in among your other plants is not only, um, you know, makes it easier, but it confuses the insects. So a lot of times you won't have to worry too much about the aphids and stuff on your tomatoes. If you have other plants, especially something like uh, marigolds or things like that in among your plants, and it can be very helpful. Plus it's lovely, it's lovely to do. Okay, going down to the next one now. Okay, there we have it, there we have it with the Yes, that's it. There we go with the different varieties of plants. There's, there's the geraniums and the lavender and what have you. And um, all right, yeah. And also, you can see that I, uh, I use those palettes again. Uh, my, my friend helped me make uh, actual shelves out of some of the palettes so I could put little plants that I knew might get knocked over by dogs running through them or something like that and put them up there. So there's different ways you can decorate it. And one of the things I saw at, at the fair one year, 
they had done a, a, a backyard table, you know, a picnic table, but in the center of it, they kind of cut a little section down and put plants all along the center. And what they put in were all your spice plants, like your, your uh, parsley and your sage and, you know, different little things that they put right across that. So when you had a picnic outside, you could actually pick them off and put, you know, put a little splash on your food as you went along. So it was really nice. And let's see, going to the next one now. Yeah, oh, this. <laughs> I'll show you pictures of my pond in a minute. But I, uh, I had a volunteer, as we often do, I had a volunteer tomato come up near my uh, waterfall. And it liked it so well that it went hydroponic. And that's what happened to that, that tomato plant. It was a, needless to say, most of them, as most of them are, they're cherry tomatoes, the volunteers that usually come up. But I had oodles of cherry tomatoes all season, which were delicious. And let's see, going to the next one now. Okay, but now you can see a little bit of my landscaping. When I moved in here, I, I came from Texas. And then I went to New, moved to New Mexico, and finally I landed out here. Well, the, the type of plants that you grow in Texas, um, you know, not always do well. You can't get a lot of gardenias where I grew up in Houston here, although, you know, people can do it. I'm still working on that. Uh, in New Mexico, it was super dry, you know. I, I sort of considered Albuquerque uh, lots of beach and no ocean. And uh, so, but then I finally got out here and I went around finding every plant I could, you know, and the nurseries are full of them, as you know. So I went around finding all the plants I could and, and putting them in my backyard. And then after a few years, I had to come to my senses a bit more and take things out. One of the things I took out was lawn because frankly, in our climate, lawn is a big pain. It gets diseases easily, or water, you know, issue is a problem for, you know, keeping lawns healthy. And it's just, uh, you know, using, using a lot more resources than I feel like it gives back. So I did a lot of paving and I had mulch there. And if you see that mulch that you see there in this particular picture, um, that comes from the, uh, recycling plants that we have here, which I will tell you more about, that are wonderful. And I'm getting ready to visit them again to get some more mulch myself. Uh, you know, you can buy it at the store, but you can get an a full truckload of mulch at places like El Miramar or uh, Miramar and El Corazon for as little as about five or 10 bucks. So it's quite a deal. And all right, so I, I really advise using your mulch. Here's when I finally landscaped that slope and, um, you know, started all over again with doing my plants more sensibly. And uh, it really helped. And that, that way I had stepping areas where I could go to and areas where, you know, it was easier for not only me, but the dogs to get to or get away from. The raised beds are a great thing. Especially as seniors, we all know how well the raised beds are. Um, let's see. All right, next. Oh, yes, here's in the raised bed. Here's some of those um, what I call freeway daisies in there, you know, and African daisies in there. And, um, you know, it just makes it so much easier. Plus, you know, it, it is somewhat of a deterrent. If I'm planting something really important in my bed, like my tomato plants, not only will I have above that brick, I will put another little fencing along that that kind of keeps them from, you know, wanting the urge to jump up on the raised bed. And so that really helps get your plant started and, and give them a good shot before, you know, they harden up and then they can pretty much take care of themselves. Plus, you don't want them peeing on your plants. Okay, next picture, Mel. Oh yes, this is my pond that I was talking about earlier. And it is lovely and um, I really enjoyed it. I 
you know, I'm beginning to wonder if I'm going to keep it with the water issue coming up as it is. But, um, you know, there's there's so many things you can do in your backyard to just sort of make it simple, and but at the same time, encourage a lot of, you know, beauty and growth. Next picture, Mel. Okay, here, this is landscaping that I did in the backyard around my trees. It, it, it kept um, not only the dogs from, you know, going too close to the tree and scratching on it or anything, but it has kept, you know, uh, things like ground squirrels uh, at a deterrent from going there. Okay, let's go down to the next thing. I'm going to go back to our things here. Go down. Okay. There we go. Okay, and I've already talked about mulching. Okay, now I'm going to talk about in the in the, on the handout you have. Here's the mulching material, and this is mulching material that you can get at places like El Corazon and Miramar. Bark chips, compost, grass. Now you can make your own grass clippings and leaves, which I have done. I, I actually have a worm bin and I you know chop up the stuff and put it in there. And after a while, it makes this wonderful worm juice, which uh, you can buy at some of places like Rangettos, but you can make your own. And uh, you mix that with water, with a, you know, like twice as much water as you would, you know, the, the solution. And it is potent, wonderful uh, additives for your soil and your vegetables and your plants. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about compost right now, too. I went to El Corazon. I'm up here in Vista, and I went to El Corazon about a week or so ago. And they have something that they call um, it's um, landsca it's landscaping mulch for plants. It's actually uh, you know almost like nursery mulch. And she said it is super good and really good to put around your plants. And right now is the time to be doing that because, as you know, our summers are really hot. So if you get some of that mulch, not only will it feed your plants but it will hold in the moisture that we so much need for it to hold in for this area. And it will really, you know, alleviate a lot of your water use. Okay. chips, And of course the bark chips I use mainly for decoration. It's a little easier on the dog's feet. I do recommend, you know, if you can use the bark chips from, from um, the, recycling places, it would probably be good. The bark chips that you get from places like Lowe's and, and Home Depot are lovely and they're colored and they're painted. But I noticed that sometimes there are some animals that react allergically to some of the dye that they use to color those chips. So that's just a word to the wise on that. Next one. Oh, newspapers, this is more, newspaper shredded, pine needles, oh, pine needles, I wish I had a pine tree in my yard, because they're wonderful for things like azaleas, hydrangeas, and uh, gardenias, and some of the other plants that, you know, we don't have a lot of acid in our soil, so it really helps keep them alive. And there at the bottom, you'll see the, the addresses, phone numbers, and everything for Miramar and El Corazon. And then here's some more of that edible landscaping pictures. You know, I grew cabbage right there in among my other plants and it did quite well. And I, um, you know, I actually right now I planted snow peas in different places in the yard because they put a, an awful lot of nitrogen back into the soil. So it is very good to get your nitrogen going back into your soil right now. Tomatoes eat, take a lot of nitrogen out of your soil. So sometimes if you come back and you think, well, I put more dirt in it. I went to Home Depot and I got some good, you know, growing 
you know, planting, you know, soil and everything, put it in there, but it still might not be enough to mix in to really bring in the nitrogen level that you need to keep your plants going. A lot of times, I, you know, I found that my tomato plants would do good for about two months, but then as it went on, they would kind of really get sickly and then they get the disease and then it was the end of this. Well, sometimes that will happen anyway. But a lot of times it is because there was not enough nitrogen in the soil and the tomatoes ate so much of it up that they just ran out of food. <laughs> and uh, that's that. So that, that's a good thing to you know plant your plants into the soil. The next picture you'll see is my attempt at hydroponics. Oh, wait. Well, maybe it's not. Ah, that's that little plant. All right, keep going down one more, Mel. Let's see if it's in there. I think I have one. Oh, that's interesting. That's the other. <laughs> I don't know why my mind that I'm doing is not agreeing with yours. But anyway, um, yeah, that is that's some other ideas of how to uh, different things that you can plant in your yard that are pet friendly. And we're going to talk in a minute about the stuff that's not so pet friendly. Oh, go one, down one more, Mel, and let's see if we've got, okay, that's also growing plants. That was growing squash. I, my squash got so big, I had to put the vines up on a trellis, but they were still growing in among, you know, an edible landscape, and so it worked. Keep going, please. There's another one. Okay. But I guess I really got carried away with that one. Now, now we're getting to it. Okay. Natural pest controls. All right. Here are some ideas that I've had from other master gardeners, some of which, as you know, every yard is different, but and some work better than others. But these are things that you can try, like catnip, which is also good. You know, dogs will eat catnip too. It's amazing. And dogs will eat your your grass. I haven't had any um, uh, pesticides in my yard for about 10 years now. And, uh, well, at least 10 years. But when I started doing that, at first it was a little difficult. But now I have got things in balance. I have plenty of lizards. I have ladybugs that come. I have butterflies, you know, and, and I have birds, lots of birds. So I pretty much have a lot of my pest problem under control as far as bugs are concerned. The other ones we'll talk about. Cutworms, here's some ideas for cutworms using can and paper collars. Fleas and ticks, um, brewer's yeast, neem. Um, also, um, yeah, neem is very good for that. And um, nematodes, yeah, nematodes will do real well with with French French miracles or um, among the vegetables. Snails, well, you can use broken eggshells and broken eggshells, they'll, they're attracted to that. So if you put them out in the yard and even if you put things like lemon skins in the yard, citrus skins, a lot of times you can go out in the morning and they'll be right on top of those skins kind of do something with them, eat them, I guess, eat the inside of them. And uh, you can just pick them up and put them in the trash. The other thing is good, which you may have seen at some uh, nurseries, are little benches. They're like a little tiny picnic bench. And the snails will, if you set them in a bushy area, the snails will locate themselves under that at night. And in the morning, you can go out and pick up that little bench, scrape it off into your garbage can, and there you go. So that's, and one other solution, of course, is decollect snails. You can get those at places like Rangettos, and you, I don't know if they have them anymore at places like Home Depot. I haven't seen them in quite a while. But they're little, pretty little snails, and they eat the bad snails. They don't eat your plants, they eat the bad snails, and uh, they do a really good job of it. And of course, seed that I have listed on there is invite your neighbors in, and by that I mean the possums. When I had a possum in my backyard visiting, I had 
no snails whatsoever. It was wonderful. And um, so I really lucked out with that. Unfortunately, a big dog would get next door and kill the possum. So I'd really like for a possum to come back if I could. And, you know, believe it or not, uh, in my publications, they, I actually have a listing for possum rescue. There is a possum rescue up in Orange County. And every once in a while, they have an event up there. And it's so cute to go up and see these little baby possums. I know they're kind of ugly, but they're really cute when they're little. And, and they're really a lifesaver for your snail people. Uh, let's see, many of the strong smelling things, uh, yeah, some things like that will repel insects. Peppermint, peppermint is supposedly, you, in fact, they sell it at the, at the uh, stores like Home Depot and, and Lowe's uh, in sprays to repel rats. Um, I haven't seen that one with peppermint. It might make your rats smell better, but I don't think it's going to actually make them go away. Let's see, choose your herbs carefully. Yeah, uh, well, yes, always if you have an herb garden. I have a special space just for my herb garden because they do spread. And, um, you know, and that's great. You know, you just pick them and they'll come back. It's not a problem. And then, of course, there's always that hot pepper solution that you see at um, Home Depot and places like the um, boats. And, you know, that can be effective of things crawling on your plants, you know, some of the bugs crawling on your plants, but you've got to be sure that you don't have uh, your dog anywhere near around because you sure don't want to get that on your nose or anything. And going down to the next page, which Mel just went to, and I'm going, there is ladybugs on aphids. And you know, I used to buy ladybugs all the time. You know, every year I'd buy them. And it's so interesting because you buy them, they're on your plants for a week or so, and then they go to the neighbor's yard. But that's okay. You know, you're doing a nice thing for your neighbor. And and the um, uh, uh, other thing, mealybug destroyers, mealy, you'll see those. You can't get those anywhere, but you'll see every once in a while you'll see them. But if you see a thing like that on one of your plants, you know, be kind to it. It is a, it really works on mealybugs and mealybugs are just treacherous. You know, pretty much you have to get rid of the plant when you see it with mealybugs. But they, if it's soon, if it's early enough, they can help. Let's see. Oh, and here's a picture of a coyote roller. This is my in-laws backyard. They have, they get, they go adjacent to a, uh, a park, and you can see the coyote roller is right up there at the top. And uh, it works very effectively, like I said, for not only coyotes, but any other thing that might want to climb the fence and come into your backyard. There are people that have built these for themselves. If you take a, a rebar, long rebar, and put it up on kind of a roller frame and put... Um, you can use, actually use um, irrigation pipe, uh, you know, to cover it, run it, run the rebar through that and stick it up there. You can sort of make your own coyote roller because these are totally inexpensive, but they are quite effective. Okay. Talking about other critters to get rid of, here's the barn owl. Let's see. Yes. Oh, wait. No, no, go back, Mel. You're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> go back. Okay. These are the critters that are a nuisance in some ways. Okay. Yeah. We've got raccoons. Uh, we've got, of course, possums. I don't consider them a nuisance. I love my possums. And we've got, um, let's see, I'm looking up here, of course, uh, you know, coyotes and, uh, and skunks and other things. Skunks do carry rabies. So, you know, I have one, I think, that visits every once in a while, but I bring my pets in at night, so there's no chance of them getting skunked or getting bit, you know, getting too active. The uh, raccoons, who 
coons are, you know, my coons have a 30 mile radius of their area that they navigate. It is amazing. So just about the time you think when the raccoon is, is um, you know, gone forever, he'll be back and he'll bring a bunch of babies too. One of the things with raccoons, make sure that there's no tree growing near your roof because this happened to a neighbor of mine and I kind of warned them about it. I said, you know, that's kind of close to your roof and you know, we have a lot of raccoons. Well, the raccoon got up on and ate her shingles, you know, pulled them up and ate through them and nested in the, in the, inside their roof. And so then they had a real problem. And of course with raccoons too, if you leave town, never, ever, ever leave your doggy door open because <laughs> a, um, a, a guy that, that removes, you know, wildlife from people's yards and stuff told me about this. These people went on vacation down in El Cajon. They left their doggy door open. The raccoons got in there and nested in their couch. When they got back, they, you know, and walked into their living room, there were little baby raccoons raising their heads up out of the couch. And of course, the kitchen was a disaster. They'd opened cabinets, they'd done everything. And it took them two weeks to just get the smell out of the house. So word to the wise on that one. Okay, let's see, going down to the next one, please. Okay, all right, we were gonna talk about gophers. All right, I have used everything imaginable through the years on my gophers that uh, it finally cleared up and I'll tell you the story about it. But I even tried those little sound things that they have that are about 20 or 30 or maybe $40 now. And I was out in the backyard, I took a phone call. And while I was talking on the phone, I noticed this, this little um, plant was sticking up, you know, it was a, a little um, sunflower. And it started shaking and I thought, well, that's odd. And then all of a sudden it dropped. And so I grabbed it and pulled it up and there was a gopher on the other end of it. It was right beside the little sound buzzer thing. So I don't have much faith in that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, gophers, owls, hawks, I, what happened finally with us is um, we had an owl. They, they didn't stick around too long, but my neighbor had an owl box and it did come for a while. And during that time, the gophers evacuated. I mean, they were like the Mayans. They just disappeared within like three days, they were gone. And then they kind of came back a little bit, but then some Cooper's hawks have come to visit us and they do a flyby every so often. And that has kept my gophers to a minimum. And uh, every once in a while one comes in, but um, I don't know, something gets it, probably the hawks, I'm hoping. But uh, at any rate, uh, an owl house no help. Uh, the gopher, everybody's got different ideas about how to get rid of gophers with, from chewing gum, you know, to dog poop on on. Some things may work for some and some for others, but I'm just not sure. You know, you can always give all those things a try. Okay, after the rain, and I don't know about you, wherever you are, but we are having a nice rain here in Vista today. Just perfect, you know, just not a hard rain, but a nice soaker. And after the rain is a good time to check your pots and planters. Look out for the slugs and snails. And like I said, rejoice when it rains because this is the perfect time to, to uh, you know, get that rain in, spread more mulch, hope it rains again. I'm hoping that this year, while the soils are wet, we, we can pull up a lot of those weeds too because this is a good time to get them out of there. And, you know, one more word, you know, your doggies do eat grass. So if you don't have any pesticides or anything on your grass, you know, save a few little places for your dogs because it's it's good vitamins for them. Now, let me see what else I haven't covered in. Let's get close to the end here. Oh, okay. 
Next one down. Let's see what you've got, Bill. See if it matches. Yes. Well, oh, good. We're matching. Okay. These are nurseries. You know, you go to the nurseries. Uh, you go to the hardware stores like Home Depot and 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 uh, Lowe's, and they're great. Don't get me wrong. But there are some nurseries that have some unusual things, and every once in a while, you want to grow maybe not just a red tomato. You want to grow a different kind of tomato, or you want to grow a purple carrot. Well, these this is a list that I've done of places that you can not only get seeds or uh, other things, you know, other kinds of plants, uh, seedlings and stuff. And so I hope that will help you in the neighborhood for that. I think I showed you this. Whoops, let me see. I have to hold it a certain way. I'm trying to figure out. This was um, from Shirley Gemmel. There it is. This is a sun chart done by one of our master gardeners. And it's excellent for you knowing how much sun uh, we get here in, in San Diego over a season. And I strongly advise that. You know, it's really good to, I refer to it quite often, you know, during the year so that I know what I'm doing a little bit. Uh, let's see. What else have I not covered? Oh, oh, I wanted to talk, I talked about pest controls. What I did not talk about very quickly is plants that are not fit for Fido and Fluffy. And I gave you some extra pages on that. I gave you a list here of plants not fit for Fido or Fluffy. And you should have it on your pages. I hope it was in there. If not, I'll be sure and send it. But this is a list of all the plants that if you have a chewer, like I do, that you might want to remove or at least pay attention to. And there is an excellent article on davesgarden.com, uh, which is uh, written by a veterinarian called Welcome to My Toxic Painful Garden. But what it's about, not only does he go in and show what he grows, because he loves to grow things too, but he shows the degree of toxicity and, and you know, what his, what his experience has been with, with animals eating and not eating things. My experience was pretty good until Annie came along, but then I discovered she was starting to eat lantana, which I had a little plant of in the backyard. I had to remove every bit of lantana because it is extremely toxic and especially bad on dogs' livers. Another thing that I just found, and I'll hold up this page and I think you've got this, is I, um, I went in my backyard, ooh, there it is, uh, this says a great herb for cats and dogs. Okay, it is a great herb for cats and dogs if it's processed properly. However, if it is not, if it is growing in your backyard, it is a bad thing for your pets because if they by chance uh, walk through it or and then lick their paws, it's going to come up on their paws. It has, you know, it has pretty good toxicity. toxicity. And as you see from the little pages I gave one to you on this, it can cause swelling, itching, drooling, vomiting, labor breathing, you know, incoordination. And I had discovered that I would never had it before. I don't know what it came in on, but, you know, like I, plants often come from, you know, uh, the people that the nurseries often get plants and, you know, they get dirt and they don't know, always know where everything comes from. But it came up in my yard last year just a little bit. So I just pulled it out. It was no big thing. I found a whole bunch of it after the rains that we had earlier, uh, you know, the last couple of months. And so I had to dig all of that out and because I also noted my dogs were itching. So, you know, Things come here and get invasive from time to time, so we just have to deal with them. If you, by some chance, want to grow it, I uh, showed you uh, what the herbal uh, properties of this are, and it, you know, it has great nutrition and all that. But I suggest you grow it on your own and definitely away from your dogs. One more thing, I think we're getting to the very last here. Yeah, oh, that was that plant, um, 
that was showing, you know, uh, I think it was a light bug on the plant. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's read it. Oh, yeah. Oh, drought tolerant vegetables. Did you have a page on that? Yeah, there's your drought tolerant vegetables. Tomato plants. Oh, picking off the suckers on the tomato plants. Yeah, that's very good for them and they can grow better. This is drought tolerant vegetables that you can grow this summer. And wrapping it up, um, you know, of course, it needs lots of patience and, uh, you know, with you and your dog. If you have any questions whatsoever, I think Shirley will put my email on for you. I would be delighted to answer any questions I can. And if I can't, I will find out. I, you know, I have a whole troop of master gardeners behind me that have lots of experience as well. And um, we'll, we'll try and find the answer for you. And I'd be happy to help. One more thing. I did show, I did send this thing on dragon fruit. I am getting ready to prune my dragon fruit, which has just totally gotten out of hand. And um, if you want dragon fruit, uh, they're, they're pretty tasty and nutritious, and they're quite expensive at the grocery store. I think they're about almost five bucks a piece now. And I will be, if you send me information or, uh, you know, that you want to get some, I will put it out on, I have a, at the bottom of my driveway, I have a box that I put things like that in. And I'd be happy for you to come and pick it up and I can give you whatever help you want on trying to grow your own dragon fruit. Because I think the more food we grow for ourselves, the better off we are. And I just heard that, uh, you know, that uh, avocados are going to be at e become even more expensive because the drug cartels are making it so hard for them to get inspectors down there that we may not be getting any. I have two avocado trees myself, and I'm going to maybe buy another one. So, having said all this, <laughs> please tell me if you have any questions that I can answer in this brief period of time. I'm sorry I talk so much, but I really get excited about plants and animals. <laughs>